On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I'm Sedge Deans, your moderator for this evening. It is now my great pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished guest. Ali Wren joined the College of Commissioners in February 2010 as European Commissioner for Economic and Monetary Affairs, and in October 2011, he was appointed Vice President of the European Commission responsible for Economic and Monetary Affairs and the Euro. Before that, he served as Commissioner for Enlargement and Commissioner for Enterprise and Information Society, respectively. Ali Wren has a doctorate in international political economy from Oxford University and a master's degree in political science from the University of Helsinki. Ladies and gentlemen, here to speak about the recovery of the European economy, please welcome Ali Wren. My intention this evening is to discuss with you the emerging recovery in the European Union from its uh, deepest uh, economic uh, crisis uh, ever. In fact, uh, California is uh, not uh, unfamiliar with uh, the curse of uh, boom and uh, bust uh, cycles uh, or fiscal and uh, financial imbalances, uh, macroeconomic uh, imbalances. These were also the underlying reason behind uh, the crisis uh, in Europe, which has been uh, essentially a combination of uh, a banking and uh, debt crisis uh, in, in Europe. In many parts of Europe, uh, the credit boom brought a massive misallocation of uh, resources uh, in the previous decade, uh, the first decade of uh, this uh, century or, or millennium. And this is why the recent crisis uh, has been no ordinary cyclical downswing, and uh, this is why we now face uh, very profound uh, structural challenges uh, in uh, Europe, uh, in the European economies. Therefore, economic reforms uh, need to continue to restore the foundations for sustainable growth uh, and uh, job creation. Our efforts uh, to tackle the crisis uh, are now slowly starting to bring results. Over the past months, uh, economic news uh, from Europe uh, have been mostly encouraging. After six quarters of uh, contraction, the European economy started uh, to recover in the summer. There is uh, now clear evidence of uh, further rebalancing inside uh, the euro area with uh, strong exports uh, in some vulnerable member states uh, and uh, with uh, strengthening domestic demand uh, in uh, surplus uh, economies. We expect this uh, recovery, recovery to grow firmer in the coming months uh, and to gather speed uh, next year. Our strategy of uh, completing the financial repair or the repair of, uh, of the banking sector and uh, financial system, pursuing uh, consistent uh, but uh, gradual and differentiated uh, consolidation of uh, public finances uh, and uh, undertaking economic reforms uh, to support uh, competitiveness uh, is now paving the way for a sustainable recovery. Combined with uh, the much enhanced uh, mechanisms uh, for coordinating economic and fiscal policies uh, in the euro area, we are witnessing uh, no less than a complete uh, reform, a complete uh, overhaul of the, the economic and uh, monetary union in Europe. And the background for that is, uh, you may know that uh, 20 years ago when the EMU was created, uh, the euro was, uh, was uh, essentially institutionally created. Uh, at uh, that point, uh, the, there was no possibility to have an agreement uh, on a strong economic union, only on a strong monetary union or, or currency union. So we have had uh, a, say, strong currency union, but at the same time, uh, no strong economic or fiscal union, nor banking union. And uh, the past uh, 10 years, especially the past five years, have shown that uh, even a strong monetary union is not uh, sustainable without uh, a strong economic uh, and uh, banking union. And that's what we are currently cor correcting. We are essentially reconstructing the economic and monetary union. We are building a banking union and uh, in fact, uh, already now, not to speak of uh, in a few years, uh, the Economic and Monetary Union will look very different from the original EMU as it was created uh, 
in the 1990s, uh, 15 to 20 years ago. Nevertheless, uh, I continue to stress that uh, any claims that uh, the crisis is over are clearly premature. There are substantial economic uh, divergences uh, between our member states uh, and in many parts of Europe, uh, unemployment uh, remains at uh, unacceptable levels. Therefore, work must continue to unwind uh, the massive uh, imbalances uh, accumulated uh, during the first uh, 10 years of uh, the EMU. In this context, uh, it is essential that uh, Europe's uh, overall policy mix uh, continues to support uh, a sustainable recovery. Monetary policy of the European Central Bank uh, remains uh, very accommodative, but uh, the persistent uh, financial fragmentation in Europe uh, implies that uh, the transmission mechanism of uh, monetary policy, of uh, say interest rate policy, is uh, not uh, yet uh, fully intact. Uh, and moreover, <clears throat> the financing conditions, uh, especially of uh, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises, uh, are in some countries uh, still very tight. Uh, it's very difficult to get uh, credit, uh, at least uh, affordable credit, uh, for households and businesses, uh, particularly for SMEs. And this is uh, the single strongest uh, drag uh, on growth uh, for the moment uh, in uh, Europe. Therefore, we are working hard to, to establish uh, quickly a fully-fledged uh, banking union, at least uh, partly inspired uh, by the U.S. Uh, example, which uh, in fact uh, has been effective in cleaning up, at least more effective and efficient uh, in cleaning up uh, its uh, banking sector and uh, allowing their, thereby growth uh, to resume. A European single supervisory mechanism for banks uh, will become operational in about uh, one year from now. And uh, in parallel, we are complementing it uh, by a single resolution mechanism in order to restructure non-viable banks uh, while protecting the stability of, uh, of the system. And uh, let me tell you that uh, this is uh, not about uh, using public money, taxpayers' money, to bail out uh, bankers, uh, as uh, the proposed uh, resolution fund uh, will be financed uh, by the banking sector itself. And the background for this is that, uh, for instance, uh, when we last had uh, stress tests uh, in uh, Europe uh, of uh, banks uh, in 2010 and uh, 2011, then we had only a very, say, confederal system instead of uh, a federal system. And uh, each and every national supervisor of uh, banks and other financial institutions uh, was responsible of uh, reporting and uh, analyzing the situation in the country. What was the result uh, in uh, countries like uh, Ireland, uh, Spain, or even Germany, we didn't get uh, the real picture of uh, the health of uh, the banks, uh, and soon after, in uh, Ireland uh, and in Spain, uh, a complete uh, banking crisis uh, erupted, uh, which uh, eroded uh, the credibility of uh, these uh, stress tests. This uh, previous method of uh, stress testing banks uh, has been called uh, financial nationalism, and I think uh, there is a point in that, uh, because uh, clearly the national supervisors uh, had an incentive to hide problems uh, in order to avoid uh, any major needs of uh, restructuring and recapitalization of banks uh, in these uh, countries. So we, we paid dearly of the lack of uh, effective uh, European-wide uh, banking supervision and resolution, and uh, that's what we are now correcting in Europe uh, with this uh, creation of uh, the single supervisory and uh, single resolution mechanisms for euro area banks. Moreover, our fiscal policies uh, are geared uh, towards uh, creating conditions uh, for growth, uh, contrary to the, I would say, misbeliefs uh, or mis uh, misunderstandings uh, of uh, some commentators. It is true that uh, due to the extreme market pressures uh, in the beginning of the debt crisis in Europe uh, 
in 2010 and 2011, the euro area member states uh, had to pursue quite ambitious uh, and uh, front-loaded uh, consolidation of uh, their public finances. But uh, our strategies uh, have been carefully differentiated and calibrated uh, according to the fiscal space, space uh, each and every member state uh, has. Uh, and now, as a result of uh, advancement uh, made in 2011-2012, the euro area as a whole is facing a more gradual consolidation path. We have uh, just, I don't want to overburden you with figures, but uh, in 2009-10, the fiscal deficit uh, in Europe uh, was uh, at uh, 6 to 7 percent, uh, while uh, today it is uh, around uh, 3 percent. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are this year consolidating about uh, half compared to last year. So this year, three quarters of GDP, last year, one and a half percent of uh, GDP. For the sake of comparison, the U.S. Uh, is this year consolidating around 2% uh, of uh, GDP, which according to Chairman Ben Bernanke has about 1% uh, uh, negative impact uh, on U.S. growth uh, this year, 2013. So the pace of uh, consolidation is uh, now clearly slower or softer in Europe uh, than uh, in the beginning of the crisis uh, or today in the U.S. Uh, and uh, its uh, drag uh, on uh, growth, uh, in short-term growth, uh, is uh, expected uh, to pretty much uh, fade away. Yet, uh, in order to ensure the sustainability of uh, recovery, it is of uh, paramount importance uh, to pursue structural reforms uh, to boost uh, investment opportunities uh, and uh, to unleash uh, the growth potential of uh, the European economies. Some uh, European Union member states uh, have made uh, substantial progress uh, in this regard uh, over the past years. Uh, Well-designed uh, economic reforms uh, can improve growth uh, even in the short run. For instance, uh, reducing regulatory barriers uh, and uh, exposing sheltered sectors uh, to stronger competition can boost uh, both uh, growth uh, and uh, employment uh, while involving little or no budgetary cost. Such reforms uh, will also further support uh, the rebalancing process uh, inside uh, the euro area. We see this uh, process of uh, rebalancing or adjustment uh, at work uh, in many countries, uh, for instance, uh, in uh, Ireland uh, and uh, in Spain. In both countries, uh, exports are growing well. Industrial production is increasing. And uh, Ireland has seen uh, some improvement uh, in employment uh, in the course of uh, this year. Spain has seen uh, unemployment uh, bottom out, uh, although it is, uh, unemployment is uh, still uh, by far too high in uh, Spain. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me now turn to, for a moment uh, to the global economic uh, developments. Uh, we have seen in the first half of uh, this year, 2013, a rebound uh, in economic activity among the advanced uh, economies uh, here in the US, uh, in Europe, uh, as well as uh, in uh, Japan. At the same time, uh, growth in uh, the emerging market economies uh, has uh, substantially slowed down, and uh, it no longer, or they no longer make uh, the largest uh, contribution to global growth uh, of uh, the world economy. The soundness of uh, their macroeconomic uh, and uh, macrofinancial fundamentals uh, has come under increased uh, scrutiny. Moreover, the expectations in financial markets uh, about uh, the future stance of uh, US uh, macroeconomic uh, policies uh, are uncertain a clear medium-term orientation in monetary policy and a more robust and uh, calibrated uh, medium-term fiscal strategy would benefit uh, both uh, the U.S. itself uh, and uh, the global economy, of course, uh, including Europe uh, as well. 
In the euro area, the member states have made uh, very significant progress uh, with uh, internal and external rebalancing. But our success uh, in uh, economic uh, adjustment uh, and uh, in solidifying uh, economic growth in Europe uh, cannot be facilitated uh, by lower global growth uh, and or by an appreciating euro. And uh, therefore, we are very much uh, in favor of uh, effective uh, policy coordination of uh, macroeconomic policies uh, among uh, the largest uh, economies uh, of the world. The current situation in the world economy could be characterized uh, as a multi-speed uh, recovery instead of uh, the three-speed recovery that, that was still uh, a popular expression half a year ago. Furthermore, the pattern of global growth uh, has shifted uh, just uh, as the euro area is uh, moving out of uh, recession. Obviously, the discussion of uh, a multi-speed recovery points to the linkages of uh, developments uh, on both sides uh, of the Atlantic. And therefore, the transatlantic uh, trade and uh, investment uh, partnership uh, between the United States uh, and the European Union could be of uh, paramount uh, importance uh, in this respect. We want uh, in Europe uh, this uh, partnership uh, to be comprehensive and uh, ambitious uh, in order to reap uh, the significant benefits uh, that are reachable for both parties, uh, for both uh, partners. Uh, it could give uh, a strong signal that uh, the EU and uh, the US uh, are committed to deepening and uh, opening trade. This would be a welcome sign of uh, economic uh, confidence uh, that uh, businesses need uh, in times of uh, uncertainty and a sign of uh, joint uh, leadership uh, on the global scale. But of course, uh, we all know that uh, economic confidence uh, is not enough. Uh, we in Europe see that uh, political confidence uh, is uh, equally important uh, for our partnership. And uh, that's why last week, uh, last uh, Thursday, Friday, the European Council, that is uh, the leaders of uh, the member states of the European Union, the prime ministers, uh, one chancellor and uh, a couple of uh, presidents, uh, met in Brussels uh, in their regular summit, uh, and they discussed uh, recent uh, developments uh, concerning intelligence issues uh, and uh, the deep concerns uh, that uh, these events uh, have raised uh, among uh, European citizens. The European Council, or the leaders of the EU, underlined uh, the close relationship uh, between Europe uh, and the US uh, and uh, the value of that uh, partnership. Uh, they expressed uh, their conviction that uh, the partnership uh, must be based on uh, respect uh, and uh, trust, uh, including uh, as concerns uh, the work and uh, cooperation of uh, secret uh, services. We know that uh, intelligence gathering is a vital element uh, in the fight against uh, terrorism this applies to relations between uh, European countries as well as to relations uh, with the US. A lack of trust uh, could, however, prejudice uh, the necessary cooperation in the field of uh, intelligence gathering. And uh, that's why we see that uh, it is now important uh, to rebuild uh, trust uh, and uh, confidence. Uh, and uh, our leaders pointed uh, to the existing working group uh, between the EU and the US uh, on the related issue of uh, data protection and uh, call for rapid and uh, constructive progress uh, in that regard. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me return to the European recovery and uh, conclude uh, by recalling how far we have uh, come in just uh, over a year. I recall my, my mission to New York uh, about a year ago, last August, uh, it was about uh, 14, 15 months ago, then uh, the talk of the town in the most important uh, financial center in the world uh, was about uh, Grexit. It seemed uh, the market forces uh, in the conferences, in dinners, in, uh, in smaller meetings I, I had, uh, had with them, almost took it for granted uh, that uh, Greece uh, would be leaving the euro and uh, the euro area would, uh, would break up. 
I told them that, uh, sorry guys, uh, you are behind the curve. We have things under control and uh, we will ensure that uh, the unity and uh, integrity of the euro area will be retained, uh, maintained. And we have uh, taken decisions uh, over the past year, especially that uh, show that uh, we have uh, ensured uh, the integrity and uh, unity of the euro area. The euro did not uh, break up, uh, as we know. The defense uh, of the integrity of our single currency required uh, some exceptional decisions uh, and uh, deeds. Uh, but uh, these measures uh, are now delivering their objectives. Uh, and moreover, the support programs for countries uh, that were about uh, to lose uh, their access to market financing, or in fact uh, lost uh, access to market financing, like in the cases of uh, Greece, uh, Ireland and uh, Portugal, these uh, support programs uh, are working clearly better than widely assumed. Ireland uh, and uh, Spain are preparing for a successful and uh, sustainable conclusion of their support programs uh, by the end of this year. We support uh, them in this uh, task uh, and uh, we want to facilitate uh, a successful exit uh, for both countries uh, and a sustainable return to market financing for both uh, Ireland uh, and uh, Spain. We will deal with uh, the issue of uh, Portugal uh, concluding its program in uh, spring, summer next year, and uh, we still have uh, difficult decisions uh, to take uh, concerning Greece uh, in the course of uh, next year. The probably best example of uh, how decisive policies uh, and uh, joint efforts uh, can deliver a transformation of an economy is uh, Latvia, a small EU member state uh, at the Baltic Sea, one of the three Baltic states, uh, together with uh, Estonia and uh, Lithuania. Latvia has recovered uh, from a very deep uh, economic crisis uh, faster than uh, anyone could predict uh, with uh, the help of uh, ambitious uh, fiscal and uh, structural reforms uh, made possible by financial support uh, by its uh, European partners uh, and uh, the International Monetary Fund. Today, the fastest growing economies in Europe uh, are Latvia, Lithuania and uh, Estonia, the three Baltic states. As a result uh, concerning Latvia, the euro will very soon not have uh, fewer members uh, but more. Latvia will start using the common currency of Europe uh, on the 1st of January next year. This is a very illustrative demonstration of the resolve that uh, Europe uh, and uh, the Europeans uh, are still capable of. Uh, and uh, trust me, there will be more success stories uh, from Europe uh, to come in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Wren. Um, we are going to take some questions. Uh, I've gotten some good questions from the audience. Um, you know, staying with your, your point uh, that you made a minute ago about confidence and the role of confidence in what you're doing, uh, and it's true in, in the United States economy as well as in Europe, uh, you've got both the economic and the political sphere. And I was wondering um, if you want to comment on the fact that, in, for example, in the, in the 17 country Eurozone, two thirds of the output comes from just three countries, Germany, France, and Italy. I believe that's correct. And that their, their disproportionate role um, makes them very pivotal. And at this time, you have uh, the German uh, political situation uh, up in the air a bit with uh, Chancellor Merkel forming a new government. Um, and some uncertainty about what the, the policy, the fiscal policy will be in that country. And at the same time, in France, you've got uh, President Hollande with pressures from both the left and the right and the new government of Leda in Italy. So you've got a lot of uncertainty out there and you're trying to get people, mainly decision makers in the private side, to, to invest and create jobs and build for the future. And that's a problem of anybody trying to spark economic growth. Uh, can you comment on the difficulty of uh, dealing with that kind of environment? With pleasure. <laughs> With pleasure because uh, we have made uh, progress in this regard uh, over the past uh, one or two years. Uh, and um, 
let me explain to you how I see this. Uh, first, uh, concerning the Eurozone as a whole, and then uh, I can comment uh, Germany and uh, France uh, as well as you refer to them. Concerning the Eurozone as a whole, we had uh, between uh, 2009 and uh, 2011, still 12, we had uh, several political crises uh, that uh, shook the foundations of the Eurozone and uh, led us, uh, led, led us uh, to the brink of, uh, of uh, say, perceived uh, breakup. I mean, uh, I was always sure that uh, the Euro will not break up uh, because there will be enough uh, political determination among the leaders of the European Union in different institutions and member states, uh, but uh, there was the perception, and uh, this perception played a role. We had uh, the Greek crisis in 2010, then uh, the Irish one in uh, late 2010. Then we had uh, the crisis in uh, the first crisis in Italy and, uh, and uh, Spain in the fall of uh, 2011. And then we had uh, several months of uh, political uncertainty in Greece uh, because of two elections and uh, uncertainty about uh, the political orientation and economic orientation of, uh, of Greece. All these, if you look at uh, bond yields, uh, you can see them uh, reflected in these uh, in these bond yields, uh, so that uh, each of these crises uh, led to the rise of uh, interest rates uh, in sovereign bonds, uh, which then led uh, some countries uh, out of uh, market finance. Up until around uh, mid 2012, and uh, as I told you about my my visit uh, to New York in August uh, 2012, that was more or less around the time of the turning point. Uh, why so? Because three things happened, uh, three factors played a role. First, uh, the Eurozone member states uh, enhanced uh, the credibility of uh, their fiscal policy, especially since 2011. Second, uh, the European Central Bank uh, took uh, decisive action to stabilize uh, financial and uh, bond markets, uh, which of course uh, helped a great deal. And third, uh, we had, by the time, reformed our economic uh, governance uh, so that uh, we now have a, a uh, workable and uh, viable medium-term framework of uh, consistent uh, fiscal consolidation and uh, boosting structural reforms. So because of these factors, uh, the political crisis we had this year, if you still remember them, Greece uh, had a, a governmental crisis uh, early, early part of this year, Portugal had uh, a political crisis. Italy has had a very difficult uh, political year. Nevertheless, uh, these have not uh, shaken uh, the very foundations uh, of the Eurozone. And that's why the situation is quite uh, different uh, today than it was, uh, say, still one and a half years ago. Concerning Germany, there is uh, usually a very strong continuity of uh, policy in both uh, European policy and economic policy in, in Germany. Of course, uh, the new coalition will, uh, will have its uh, policies uh, agreed uh, shortly, and uh, they may somewhat differ with normal in democracies uh, compared to the previous coalition. But uh, in terms of uh, the German approach uh, to Europe uh, and uh, to economic policy, I would not expect uh, any major revolution, rather evolution and uh, continuity. And one final point uh, before taking the next question, talking about uh, <clears throat> the Eurozone in its entirety and uh, having a, a um, right or optimal policy stance, uh, policy mix uh, for the Eurozone in its uh, entirety. The two largest economies, uh, Germany and France, uh, would do the greatest service uh, for sustainable growth and uh, job creation in Europe uh, by complementary economic policies uh, so that uh, Germany would uh, further strengthen its uh, domestic demand uh, and uh, boost investment, uh, while France uh, should uh, further intensify economic reforms uh, in order to boost uh, competitiveness, uh, growth, and uh, employment uh, in the in the country. And that's what we have uh, we have uh, recommended to both countries. Uh, that's what uh, the Council of the European Union has uh, recommended to both countries, uh, and that is now part of very intensive uh, policy dialogue uh, between the Commission and uh, the French government and also with the, with the German government.
And, and in, in doing these reforms, uh, for example, in France, the labor market reforms that have been recommended, it's obviously falling upon certain labor groups and um, supporters of the socialist government to, you know, make these kind of concessions, whether they be in wage form or in work rules or other things. And I'm curious, if you look at that down the road and if they were to fully implement these things, do you foresee any kind of increase in um, income inequality uh, coming from those kinds of of uh, reforms where the cure for some of these high unemployment rates that you cited, I think it's overall 12 percent now, uh, might be that some people are going to make less income or have, um, you know, policies change that are going to make job uh, flexibility greater to stimulate employment. Is that going to have um, effects down the road, do you suppose, on the quality of living or the uh, uh, standard of living in, in these countries? I think that uh, having a job is uh, usually the best uh, social policy. And uh, if you compare Germany and uh, France uh, in this regard, uh, Germany has uh, unemployment uh, around, uh, well, it's uh, less than half of, uh, of uh, French unemployment uh, for the moment. Uh, and uh, that's uh, enhancing uh, both economic uh, and uh, social welfare in Germany, and that's keeping uh, keeping domestic demand uh, stronger and uh, it is uh, facilitating uh, thus uh, overall stronger economic uh, performance. Uh, so um, I believe that uh, if you have uh, a uh, better functioning labor market, uh, you can uh, thus uh, create uh, wealth and welfare in the whole society, whole economy, and uh, that usually benefits uh, everybody. In this sense, uh, I know the U.S. debate to an extent, uh, the U.S. policy debate, uh, and uh, there is a big distinction, big, big difference uh, to the policy debate in Europe, uh, because uh, in Europe uh, the labor markets uh, are usually normal, more and av on average uh, more rigid, uh, and uh, also the public sector is uh, clearly on average uh, much larger than in the United States. Uh, so um, sometimes I feel that uh, some pundits uh, in the U.S., uh, when they comment uh, European events, uh, they actually are aiming their words uh, to the U.S. audience uh, while they are, in fact, misusing Europe uh, as a policy policy-making example. By way of example, uh, uh, there were some pundits uh, who were of the view that uh, France uh, should uh, not uh, consolidate its uh, public finances. It could still uh, uh, engage in fiscal stimulus uh, in a situation where its uh, level of public debt is uh, very elevated, uh, close to 100 percent, uh, soon above 90 percent, uh, and uh, where uh, France is uh, facing uh, other major economic uh, challenges, uh, and where the public sector is uh, today around uh, 57 percent uh, of uh, GDP in France. So. Uh, I would not think that uh, France would solve its uh, structural problems uh, by further fiscal stimulus uh, in such a context. Sweden uh, ended up uh, in, a, in a dead end uh, when uh, the public sector covered around 70% uh, uh, of the whole economy in the late 1970s and uh, early 19, 1980s. Uh, that was a time when the author of uh, children books, uh, well, they are actually of adult quality, but uh, children books uh, her name, is, uh, her name was uh, Astrid Lindgren. She wrote uh, an innocent uh, letter to the main newspaper in, in Sweden, just pointing out that uh, her tax rate uh, was 102 percent of her income. <laughs> <laughs> so it's no wonder that uh, Sweden was not uh, very dynamic in the late 70s, early 80s. And in fact, uh, all the Nordic countries, uh, while they are often portrayed as uh, success stories uh, today and in the past uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, they went through a very very difficult uh, period uh, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, and they uh, they engaged in uh, very significant economic reforms. Uh, and uh, to my mind, uh, they have been able to combine uh, economic dynamism and uh, social justice uh, to a reasonable extent. Okay. Well, staying for a minute with the theme of uh, Americans co-opting European economic ideas, um, there was a question about um, the. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, back in 1980, uh, 1944 at Bretton Woods, uh, he made an eloquent argument that economic adjustment should not be the duty of deficit countries, but should be shared symmetrically. 
How much easier would your tasks have been if his point of view had been become a settled part of international institutional practice? Thank you. If uh, that would have been uh, a settled part of international practice, I think uh, I would lose my job. I mean, there would be <laughs> no need for that. Uh. Okay. But uh, in fact, uh, there was another quotation of, uh, of Keynes of the period uh, when he said uh, something like, which is quite close to what you, what you said uh, you referred to. Keynes said, uh, I mean, you have to recall that uh, Keynes in, uh, in the early 1940s uh, was not writing, and I hope I'm not upsetting anybody, but uh, Keynes was not writing as an economist, uh, but uh, as a policymaker of the United Kingdom. I mean, he was the chief negotiator of the United Kingdom with uh, the Soviet spy, Harry Dexter White, uh, who was leading uh, the negotiations uh, from the US side uh, at Bretton Woods. Uh. And you have to take Keynes's words uh, against that uh, lens uh, also, because he was defending the British interest uh, in that context. But he, he was saying that uh, he was referring to rebalancing or, or economic uh, adjustment uh, between surplus countries and deficit countries, uh, the US being the surplus country in uh, 1944 and uh, the UK being one of the major deficit countries, uh, very indebted uh, after the lend lease program. So Keynes said that uh, for, a, for a surplus country, economic adjustment uh, is uh, voluntary, while uh, for a deficit country, it is uh, obligatory. And uh, I'm not saying that uh, this is how it should be in the ideal world, uh, but uh, this is how uh, certain uh, economic and political realism uh, make people to work, uh, and it's part of the reality. And that's why we have uh, tried to work quite hard in Europe, that we, we recommend uh, and we work with member states uh, so that uh, we differentiate uh, our policy advice uh, according to the particular needs of uh, each and every member state, uh, as well as the Eurozone as a whole. And that's why, as I said, uh, for Germany, for instance, uh, and I hope that uh, in the coalition talks uh, this will be this will be uh, uh, taken into account. Uh, it's, it would be very important that uh, Germany would uh, further strengthen its uh, domestic demand uh, by sustaining uh, strong wage growth and uh, reducing uh, labor costs, uh, especially in uh, low income of low income earners. And uh, also, Germany could afford. Uh, to increase uh, productive investment uh, to uh, education, innovation, and uh, infrastructure in the current uh, context. Uh, that would be good for Germany herself, uh, as well as uh, for the Eurozone as a whole. In, in, in talking about fiscal policy in this country, uh, and I know it's true also in Europe, there's a lot of use of things like the multiplier effect to justify different policy prescriptions. Um, what has been learned uh, from the experience that you've had in Europe with the different member states uh, where fiscal policies have been pursued in different ways about what, uh, what multiplier effects really uh, are and whether some of these, uh, as you mentioned, Germany is an example of a, of a um, sort of a low uh, deficit approach to, uh, to recovery. Um, other places like Greece and UK has pursued uh, uh, its form of austerity and other states have taken different paths. What's been learned? I think uh, what we have uh, learned already in the early years of the crisis uh, is that uh, in, uh, in the crisis context, uh, the fiscal multipliers uh, tend to be quite large, which means that uh, fiscal consolidation has uh, a larger effect uh, on short-term, larger negative effect uh, on uh, short-term economic growth uh, than you would have uh, under, say, more normal circumstances uh, when, you, when you don't have uh, a financial crisis. One reason for this is that uh, monetary policy is uh, already at, uh, at the, the floor, at uh, the zero, zero bound, uh, zero rate bound, and uh, it means that uh, while you could, in principle, tighten fiscal policy and uh, ease in monetary policy, you don't have that much room of uh, ease in monetary policy anymore. And uh, that's why the fiscal multiplier also is, uh, is uh, larger. We use uh, fiscal multipliers, uh, which are, in fact, uh, defined uh, country by country. In the desks uh, of the European Commission, we have uh, 
we have plenty of economists uh, who work in the country teams, uh, and uh, each of these country team teams uh, uh, defines uh, the fiscal multiplier. Of course, we, we coordinate, uh, but we don't have a kind of uh, a uniform multiplier across all the countries and uh, across time. But we try to adjust it, uh, take into account uh, the real events uh, in the real economy of that, uh, of that, uh, or every member state. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's the, that's the best way of, uh, of doing it. Uh, to my mind, uh, it was already clear. It was always clear that uh, the fiscal multipliers are larger than in the normal times, uh, and that's why some uh, research reports uh, from the IMF uh, around a year ago they are not they are not such uh, big news uh, to us, uh, and we had already slowed down slowed down the pace of uh, consolidation by then. And uh, with due respect, uh, the IMF is uh, giving uh, one day one advice, another day another advice uh, in terms of fiscal policy. For instance, uh, concerning the UK, at, the, at some point, uh, the IMF was uh, advising the UK to to uh, relax its uh, policies of uh, fiscal consolidation. Now, I think uh, the IMF is uh, more supportive as. Uh, the UK fiscal effort uh, seems to be paying off, and the country is uh, returning to to more solid recovery. Okay. Um, in, in terms of the banking sector, you talked about uh, earlier. Um, one of the key drivers is the availability of credit, and that's the you know both the availability through the banking system and the demand for credit. Um, how will banks embark on the extending of more credit? especially, uh, as you pointed out, I think, in your blogs, the uh, small and medium enterprises being the critical sector that need the, uh, the, the bank financing uh, in order for growth to take root. Yeah, this, this has been, uh, over the past, uh, past years, uh, a major problem, especially in southern Europe. And uh, why is this so? It is because uh, these countries uh, are now facing the major challenge of uh, deleveraging of, uh, of uh, private debt uh, as well as uh, consolidation of, uh, of uh, their public finances. And uh, these countries uh, have had to, had to take uh, quite uh, strong action in this regard. Uh, and uh, we have seen that uh, the previous uh, credit flows uh, have uh, clearly dried up uh, by previous credit flows, I refer to the transfer of uh, surplus uh, from Germany and uh, other surplus countries uh, to the periphery of uh, Europe, uh, to the deficit countries, uh, where these uh, capital flows uh, were not usually or often used uh, in a very productive way. I mean, they were used, uh, this credit boom was, was used uh, for a real estate bubble, which uh, was behind uh, the province of uh, Spain or Ireland or, or some other countries. So as this uh, deliberating has happened, uh, the credit uh, has uh, tightened uh, in countries like uh, Spain or uh, Portugal, Italy, Ireland. Uh, and uh, we need to address this uh, now by constructing the banking union, which will help uh, to combat uh, the process of uh, financial fragmentation, which is behind uh, these uh, higher borrowing costs in uh, in countries of southern Europe, uh, but we also have to take uh, more short-term action, and uh, we are using the European Investment Bank for that purpose. Uh, in the end of last year, the EIB's, uh, which, by the way, it's uh, maybe the best best kept secret uh, in the world economy that. Uh, the European Investment Bank uh, is the largest uh, public bank. Uh, it's larger than the World Bank Group, uh, for instance. Uh, but uh, we are not very good in advertising that uh, always. Uh, anyway, the, the EIB capital was increased uh, by 10 billion euro, which uh, facilitates uh, 60 billion euro of, uh, of uh, lending, increased lending capacity, which uh, with normal co-financing rate reached 180 billion euros. Uh, of uh, investment uh, over three years. So uh, we have uh, increased uh, through this uh, public development bank uh, the provision of uh, credit uh, in Europe. Uh, the European Central Bank has uh, undertaken uh, two rounds of uh, long-term refinancing operations, uh, which has uh, flooded the banks with uh, liquidity. 
and uh, my understanding is that uh, they are considering contemplating maybe another round uh, and uh, in addition to this uh, just recently we have uh, agreed uh, on a specific initiative uh, to enhance lending for small and medium sized uh, enterprises uh, which is very technical, I don't want to go into, into details of that, but uh, it's uh, essentially combining the European Union budget uh, and uh, the European Investment Bank uh, to take the first loss, uh, and then uh, we expect that uh, through asset-backed securities, uh, the ECB could uh, leverage this uh, so that it would have uh, a strong impact uh, and lower the, lower the borrowing costs of uh, SMEs, uh, which is really the biggest bottleneck of uh, economic growth in Europe for the moment. Mm -hmm. Staying with banking for a moment, um, there are a lot of uh, bankers in the audience, and I know we, uh, we have uh, undertaken a lot of reform in this country under mainly the Dodd-Frank framework that I think you referenced earlier. And last week, I believe, the European Central Bank undertook the beginning of a, uh, a review of the top 130 banks around to uh, try to institute some of the capital requirements and the Basel III uh, re requirements that... Um, they would like to have before taking over supervision of those banks, I believe, next year. So can you comment in a broad way about the United States approach to the banking reforms we've undertaken and comparing to how Europe is approaching the banking sector and, and what the maybe strengths of each would be? Yes, uh, you have, uh, in fact, uh, in the U.S., uh, you have taken action much earlier than, uh, than Europe. Uh, and I'm not only referring to, to the TARP program, and uh, the Fed's actions in 2008-2009. I'm also referring to year, the year 1934, when the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation was created, uh, and when in the 1930s uh, the Fed uh, took uh, the role of, the, of a real central bank uh, as the lender of uh, last resort. So my point is that uh, in the U.S. Uh, you have uh, a... Uh, functioning federal system of, uh, of uh, backstop, uh, both, uh, say, government backstop uh, and uh, a central bank, uh, as well as uh, a um, common deposit guarantee scheme. And that helped uh, a great deal when the financial crisis hit the U.S. Uh, in 2007-2008. But then also, I must say that uh, the, the United States uh, took uh, more rapid uh, and uh, effective action with uh, the TARP program and uh, the actions undertaken by, by, the, by the Fed and uh, the administration at the time uh, supported by the Congress uh, enhanced uh, the financial repair in the U.S. Uh, so that uh, I know that there are challenges and there are new challenges again, but uh, nevertheless uh, that paved the way for stronger growth uh, in the U.S. Uh, than in Europe uh, over the past years. It's not brilliant. Uh, we, both, we all know it. Uh, it's not brilliant uh, neither in the U.S. or in, in Europe. Uh, but uh, the recovery started earlier in the U.S. Uh, growth has been somewhat stronger. And uh, our analysis is that uh, one of the main reasons is that uh, the U.S. Uh, was more effective in the cleanup uh, on the banking sector. It's, we started uh, in 2009 but uh, there is still, uh, and we have done a lot uh, already, but we have to complete the financial repair and thus uh, reinforce uh, confidence uh, and uh, restore the recovery in the European economy. Okay, and, and I, I wanted to kind of step back to a more global perspective. And there was an interesting point reached last month when the United States Congress was having its problems coming up with uh, decisions and a lot around the, a lot of talk around the world was, uh, was sort of talking about how there needs to be a de-Americanization of the financial system. I think the leading voice for that was China, um, but there is sort of this sense that you know for the last 50, 60 years it's been uh, a financial system dominated by the dollar and the U.S. Treasury has been the, the standard, and um, you know with a lot of the difficulties that have been very visible here in this country. Do you uh, agree that there needs to be a, a de-Americanization of the system? And what would that look like if it did take place? A very innocent question. What do you mean by de-Americanization of the financial system? That was a term that came out of, uh, uh, I believe it was the Chinese um, 
treasury function that was uh, holding all of these bonds that they weren't quite sure if they were going to be paid this month. Um, so it, it was a concept, I think, as I understood it, of, look, we've got such a, uh, an overdependence, and the Russians have had similar comments as well in the press about, you know, the whole system is geared so much to the U.S. Treasury as the fundamental no-risk asset, and, uh, you know, the, the, the price of everything geared off of the U.S. dollar. And so I guess my question to you is, what would that look like? I don't know. It's, uh, it's a very new concept, but it's probably uh, something that a lot of people have been giving thought to, and maybe the euro has a role in that. As a uh, resting scholar of uh, international political economy, uh, I would say that, uh, of course, the U.S. has uh, greatly benefited from the exorbitant uh, privilege uh, and uh, for having the international reserve currency. It has uh, helped you even if uh, your public debt is uh, reaching 100 percent of, uh, of GDP. Um, Nevertheless, uh, you can uh, finance your public debt uh, with uh, very low borrowing costs uh, because everybody knows that uh, in the end of the day, uh, these uh, treasury bonds will be backed uh, by the Fed and, uh, if needed, by the, by the government. And as you have the international reserve currency which uh, facilitates, uh, say, servicing the debt uh, with a, um, some uh, international uh, burden sharing. Having said that, uh, at the same time, uh, I think it's uh, only realism that uh, the international monetary system will, uh, in the foreseeable future, be largely based on, on uh, certain uh, Western currencies uh, where the U.S. dollar is likely to, likely to prevail as uh, the predominant uh, currency. The euro has become uh, a significant uh, international reserve currency I think uh, the latest uh, figures are around 25% uh, of uh, international reserves uh, are denominated in, in the euros. But uh, I would not expect uh, any, any rapid uh, revolutionary change uh, in, this, in this regard. Uh, meanwhile, it's more important uh, how we all reform our financial systems uh, so that uh, they will do their basic job uh, well, which is uh, to finance the real economy and uh, support uh, economic development uh, over the real economy of real societies and uh, real people. And that's why it's very important that uh, in the context of uh, Group 20 and uh, the Financial Stability Board, uh, which is uh, combining the central bankers, uh, governments uh, and uh, financial supervisors, uh, supervisors uh, we have been able to agree on uh, a global approach uh, to financial sector reform. And that's, in fact, uh, one of the untold uh, success stories uh, of the past uh, three or four years. Uh, under the leadership of uh, G20, often Europe uh, and the United States uh, together, we have been able to reform financial regulation and supervision to a very large extent uh, and uh, pretty much in depth. Uh, and we have even been able to do it uh, so that uh, we have a more or less uh, coordinated or even uniform approach uh, in terms of uh, financial regulatory reform. We have to complete that uh, so that uh, our financial systems are safer, healthier and uh, more resilient uh, and uh, do the basic job right, which is uh, indeed uh, financing the real economy. Okay, and one more question sort of following up on this relationship of the U.S. decision-making to the European one. There's this tapering of the Fed stimulus that's, that's bound to come at some point, and everybody's been speculating, uh, and certainly with the new potential um, Fed Chair Yellen coming, there's a, a lot uh, of speculation about how this would be done and what the effect might be. And I was curious, uh, if you think about how the tapering might uh, take place, whether there might be a situation where the optimal uh, Fed strategy for the United States differs from the optimal strategy for, say, Europe or the emerging markets, and there's definitely a knock-on effect to what's done here. So um, what would you say about this, uh, you know, QE3 and the, and the tapering of this um, 85 billion a month that uh, has been going on for some time? I believe that uh, the main challenge uh, is to ensure that uh, this uh, phasing out of uh, monetary stimulus uh, or tapering of uh, the QE is done uh, in a gradual manner so that uh, it will not uh, 
suddenly shake uh, the still very fragile and nascent uh, economic recovery in the, in the world economy. And as you refer to the potential conflict between, say, uh, the direct U.S. Uh, interest uh, and uh, the direct uh, global concerns, uh, I have heard uh, Chairman Bernanke say that uh, the United States uh, is aware that it is uh, part of a global economic system and uh, it takes into account uh, the feedback uh, and uh, the inter interdependence. Uh, uh, to my mind, it's uh, quite obvious that uh, all central banks, uh, especially of the advanced economies, uh, all central banks uh, will have to carefully calibrate uh, their strategy. And uh, I, would, uh, I would be rather safe than sorry. I would, uh, I would play it safe uh, and uh, have a rather gradual approach uh, to phasing out of uh, all the monetary stimulus uh, that we have uh, in the U.S., uh, in Europe, uh, as well as uh, in Japan, so that we don't harm the still uh, uh, quite uh, subdued and uh, nascent uh, recovery in the, in the world economy. At the same time, uh, those countries uh, who will face the challenge of uh, capital flows, uh, we know that uh, this is uh, the case for many emerging market economies. Uh, China is maybe a little bit different uh, case uh, because of its uh, size and, uh, and uh, economic uh, strength. Uh, but uh, countries like uh, India, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico will face uh, a major challenge uh, once uh, the phasing out of monetary stimulus uh, will really and effectively start. Uh, and uh, they should use this time to such kind of uh, structural reforms uh, that will make their economic fundamentals uh, stronger and uh, these countries uh, better able to absorb uh, the shocks uh, which are not only theoretical, they will come at some point. Uh, I mean, there will be the phasing out of uh, monetary stimulus at some point. Uh, so please prepare for that uh, also in the emerging economies. Uh, so we need, uh, I think this is again, uh, and it's uh, appropriate to say that this in the World Affairs Council of uh, Northern California. This is again uh, a clear case uh, where international policy coordination is needed uh, between the central banks uh, as well as uh, between the governments of, uh, that are important for the world economy. Thank you. And one last question. There's been a number of uh, questions come from the audience about potential uh, countries exiting the euro. And I, I wonder first if you think that the entire risk of that has passed. And if, if not, um, you know, it's, um, is it possible either to see uh, a country uh, unable to stay in the euro on the periphery or at the core a country leaving the euro because it finds it in its own interest? I don't see that uh, there is uh, going to be any country leaving the euro. And uh, in fact, uh, if you recall spring 2012, uh, summer 2012, uh, I remember the European Council of uh, June 2012, uh, following the Greek elections, the second elections in, in Greece. Uh, I would say that uh, that was clearly the, the turning point, uh, the period between June and uh, September 2012. First, uh, the European Council realizing that uh, they have to take uh, a clearly much stronger, stronger approach uh, to defend uh, the euro. All the member states uh, then uh, got their act together and uh, decided that uh, they will ensure that uh, Greece also will stay as member of the euro. Then uh, Mario Draghi made his uh, famous speech uh, at the Olympic Games uh, in London on the 25th of July 2012, pledging that uh, he will take, uh, he will d do everything that it takes uh, to ensure that uh, the euro will survive and that will be enough. And subsequently, the ECB took decisions on the on the principles for outright monetary transactions, uh, which would mean uh, secondary market interventions uh, if needed uh, in uh, August and uh, September. That was a decisive, uh, the decisive period uh, for, the, for the euro, and uh, I do not see that uh, there is uh, any real danger of uh, euro disintegrating. But at the same time, uh, there is no complacency in Europe. Uh, we know that uh, we have still much to do, and uh, we have to pursue economic reforms uh, in the member states uh, 
and we have to continue to reconstruct uh, the Economic and Monetary Union or the Eurozone, foundations of the Eurozone as a, as a whole. As I said, uh, next year we'll have the 18th member, so the Euro will not be in the same composition anymore, true, but it's not a few members, so it's uh, one more. Latvia will join 2014. Lithuania may be able to join uh, soon afterwards, uh, let's see. And uh, there are some other candidates uh, in, uh, in, in the queue to join the Euro even after that. But of course, as I said, uh, it will be a very different uh, Eurozone and a very different uh, economic and monetary union than the original one that was constructed uh, some 20 years ago in, in Maastricht, which was not sustainable as we saw. Well, with that positive but uh, cautionary note, I'd like to thank you and uh, conclude our program for this evening. On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I ask you to join me in thanking Ali Wren for his excellent talk and discussion.